Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for us to be here today to talk about MetaPortal, publishing, teaching, and learner assessment materials. The next slide. Great. So the oh. objective. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, by the end of the session, we should all be able to describe the principles of educational scholarship, give examples of publications in MetaPortal that highlight the needs of Latinx and Hispanic patients and communities, and list strategies for framing educational work to improve the publishability of all our work. Dr. Juan. Great. And um, meanwhile, I did want to echo what Juan said about this being a conversation. I, I just actually, I love numbers like this because it means we can just interact and jump in with questions. And both of us, Dr. Silva and I would love to be interrupted with, you know, the things that are really on your heart as you think about this topic. So think about our content really as a scaffold for the conversation and feel free to jump in, use the chat and so forth. Um, so I will start with talking about a framework that always reminds me that what I do as an educator is not just this like marginalized area, right? So a lot of times people think about scholarship as the scholarship of discovery and they talk about the Nobel Prize winners and the research that they do. But when you look at scholarship writ large, there are actually four equal components to it. And it, I would add to that the scholarship of integration which is about how do we work together in teams? So this really embraces multidisciplinary work. Then there's the scholarship of application. When you're practicing clinical medicine, you are basically doing the scholarship of application. You just need to take that extra step to document that work. And then the scholarship of teaching and learning is what we're gonna be talking about today and thinking about how do you translate your teaching and the learning process into scholarship. So this is one framework, I'd say, and the second one before I turn it back to Dr. Silva is to think about like, how do I actually do that on a practical level? All of us here are educators and I will assume that you are great teachers. So not just good teaching, but that you're doing great teaching. I define that as something that is effective and you know, goal oriented, driven by your objectives. But there's a way to take the teaching that you do right now and make it scholarly. When I think about scholarly teaching, it means taking what's going on in the world around me and bringing that into the classroom or the clinical setting in which I'm teaching. So it, making sure that it's informed by the most up-to-date evidence and that it's kind of pushing the boundaries on what we traditionally do. So that is something I would ask you to aspire to in any teaching interaction that you have. But the scholarship of teaching and learning is in some ways, one way to think about it, an end game for teaching. How do we investigate the process of teaching and learning and then put it out for peer review? And those are the two elements. Those are the only two ingredients that you need in order for something to be considered scholarship, that you did some kind of study of it and also that it was put out in a public arena for peer review. Back to Dr. Silva, yeah. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my story and how I ended publishing in Matter Portal, because I think a lot of us go through very similar study uh, stories. So I'm a general pediatrician since 2000. I've been a faculty member since 2000. Most of my clinical work has been as a pediatric hospital hospitalist. I finally took the board the first time it was given in 2019. Um, I've been a general pediatric section chief, and Dr. Maria Soto Green was saying in the last workshop that sometimes we let people take our, our care of our careers. I did that. It lasted a very few years. Um, it was not for me. I am a medical educator. That's what I do. So I've been a course director, clinical skills program director, curriculum office director, faculty development program director. Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Accreditation Office Director. Um, and for the last eight months, I was the interim Dean for Academic Affairs of the Medical Sciences Campus. Also worked in accreditation at the LCME in site visits and with other accreditation agencies. And through it all, until 2018, I've only published twice. Um, a lot of scholarship, 
invite a guest, but publishing twice. I did very little research. And I tell myself, but it is true, that I had real, very little support because educational research is not one of the priorities of our institution. And I think it's general knowledge that the University of Puerto Rico has limited funding, right? So when you decide to do educational research, you're kind of on your own. So one of the things I'm going to say, and I'm going to repeat it in the next slide, because it's very important, is that it is never too late to start. I've been a faculty member for many years, and I just started three years ago to work towards my publishing goals. It's interesting because I can't say I never thought about it. Of course I did. Of course I did over and over. And I had these ideas. I just didn't know how to go from the idea to the end result, which was scholarship, right? Um, and MetaPortal has provided the opportunity to align my mission, which is improving the health of Puerto Rican patients in Puerto Rico through better education towards my goals with publishing. Next slide, please. So when you think about MetaPortal, one of the things I, I really like about it is that you can make your work and your teaching and your leadership count twice. And that is one of um, the Dr. Huang's main ideas. And it actually, for me, everything started with her. So she gave a presentation with Dr. J.P. Sanchez, which I'll call J.P. from now on, at the Universidad Central del Caribe from where Alvaro is. And I can see Alvaro, Dr. Perez around here. Uh, that's one of our medical schools in Puerto Rico, about MetaPortal. And I was very fortunate to attend. It actually changed part of my career. And Dr. Huang not only told us about how to publish in MetaPortal, but she also provided really good and important tips on how to publish in general. So that opens your mind and what journals could align more with our education mission and the support we have in our institutions. And I thought sitting there, hmm, you know, maybe it is never too late. Maybe I can do this even without huge support from my institution. Maybe the support is in collaboration. So this, this presentation that is very similar to one you're going to be hearing today open a door of possibilities, the possibility of outside collaboration with others that are interested in the same areas as me. Um, and MetaPortal has been amazing because I've been able to build a niche. I was able to align what I care about, what I do, not only what I care about in terms of teaching, which is taking care of Puerto Rican patient, but also what I do in medical education. And you will see the two publications um, with being able to publish. I was very fearful and uncertain at first. I remember the call from JP, and I'll tell you a little bit more later on. And I thought I'm not going to be able to do this because one thing that we all need to remember is that this is peer review scholarship. So it has to be rigorous. It has to be well thought out. It has to be coherent, okay? Um, and that's where mentors come in. And Dr. Sanchez has been my mentor through all this process. Next slide. So what has been the impact of finally publishing? First is empowerment and confidence. So the first time, like I said, I didn't think I could do it. Then I did it. Then I did it a second time. And now I know I can do it again. And it will make a difference. It's not just publishing like a check mark. I, I did that. I already did that for promotion, right? And I think a lot of us, um, when we're not in the research track, we do it for promotion. Now it's more of something that's close to my heart and I wanted to make a difference. So it, it is important to, to feel that confidence and be confident in what you do. It also provided a template for an expert uh, publication. Once you know what is expected and once you know what you need to do, then it is a lot easier to go ahead. So six months ago, we were starting in our self-directed learning module, uh, following the LCME guidelines. And it's interesting because like I said, we don't have a lot of support. So we had to put a stop to that so I could be entering provost. Now I just ended my entering time. So the first thing I did last week was call my colleagues and said, we're taking this again, we're doing this. So in a way, once you publish and you get involved, you need to be that motor 
that keeps running so others can see that they can do it. And we've also been involved in teaching an assessment in, in Spanish through the Marco Spanish. Because counting twice, if my module counted twice, not only as a clinical module and a teaching module, but also uh, as a medical Spanish module. Dissemination around the world and the outside my profession, I've been invited to be part of um, the National Hispanic Heritage Month in the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. That's what that was after it was published. I've also been invited twice to the International Nursing Association. I was only able to participate once because the second times coincided with the last leaders, leaders um, conference. Uh, you start building a reputation, and now I get invited to do multiple reviews uh, for Metaportal. I just have one that I need to hand in before next week. Um, and new national roles, so I'm a faculty mentor now, still being trained. And you get to spread the skills and knowledge to junior faculty in a targeted manner. And you also um, get to be a mentor. I just put in contact Pilar Ortega, who has also published in Medical Portal through uh, Medical Spanish, through, with one of my mentees at the medical schools, so they can publish together. So that that's also very important. And like I said, all this started with a talk with Dr. Juan at um, the Universidad Central del Caribe. Next slide. This is a snapshot of my first publication, Taking Care of the Puerto Rican Patient, Historical Perspectives, Health Status, and Healthcare Access. Um, next slide. How it started. So it started with a call from JP. He remembered that I told him at that um, activity with Dr. Wang and him that I think I would be interesting of doing a module of taking care of the Puerto Rican patient. And, and he said, well, you wanted to do this. I think you might want to present at some schools during the Hispanic Heritage Month as part of the methodology. Remember, this is research. As part of the methodology of implementing your module and getting evaluated and getting some results. So let's do something related to Puerto Rican patients because this is an area that's very in, is, is of interest to me, right? And he said, so if you can do it in the Puerto Rican island, you can do the same thing in the US mainland. I said, yes, I love this, I will do this. I said it very enthusiastically in the process I, I, I was fearful, right? And that is just normal. At points I thought I was not gonna be able to, but that's where mentors come in. He took me every step of the way. He would, you know, most of the time he would cheer me on. He would go, yes, you can, yes, you can. You can do it, it's, it's turning out okay. Um, it started with a call, but it ended with presentations at seven medical schools in New York. And these schools wanted to collaborate. They were interested in the topic. That topic had not been done before. So they wanted to collaborate and they also participated uh, through the process of writing down the manuscript and submitting for publication. Next slide. So what is the process? So the third one is gonna uh, go into the process more in depth, but for me, the most important part of the process is to be very thorough and think about your objectives. What is the end result? This is teaching. Education always starts with competencies and objectives. It starts at the end. The same thing goes with educational research. What do you want your learners to know, to do? What attitudes and behaviors you want them to change? And then be sure to align it very closely to your evaluation method. Now, in my case, the evaluation method was provided to me because we had a student also working. So when the topic was decided, the student did the evaluation and I didn't want to change it for her because she was a fourth year student. And I thought, you know, mate, I'll align it. So I aligned my objectives to the evaluation. Some nick and tuck there. And the third thing you have to do is search for similar publications. Not only as a template, it is important to use it as a template, but just because it is good form. You have to do your background. You start with Medic Portal. There was nothing in Medic Portal about taking care of a Puerto Rican patient, but I could see templates there. I could, you know, take ideas because that's education and it is peer reviewed education. So that helps. But also, you need to look at scholarship, academic medicine, and other similar journals. 
then you need to develop your teaching module, making sure that you are teaching so that your learners can achieve your objectives and your evaluation um, methodology will measure that outcome. You implement the module, and after that, you get the results. So one of the things uh, I, I did, and this was obviously JP, he told me when you're writing your module and you decide your methodology, in this case, we decided a uh, case discussion guide, you need to write the case discussion guide, not just you, because you can teach in one way, but the idea of Matter Portal is that others can take your module and implement it and get the same results. So that's where the faculty guide comes in and the different guides that you write. The faculty guide, it's a step-by-step -step explanation of um, your module. In our case, it was a PowerPoint presentation with case discussions, it was very specific. So for this uh, work, it was quite linear, uh, but we did receive feedback. We made the changes that uh, we received from the feedback and we got it published. Next slide. Now, the second publication was not linear at all. This was a totally different experience. And, and I just wanted to say that once you know how to publish a Meta Portal, then it, it is a lot um, less hard, I guess, or easier. So for this one, JP called me and said, we have a, already a conference. There are objectives and evaluations there are people signed in, this is happening. And we still need for someone to write the model of the Office of Medical Education. This was for Benga. It was um, a conference for students and residents to learn about the different offices of the medical schools and what they do. At the time I was the academic dean at my medical school. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. Um, but I had to adjust to the objectives already done and to the evaluation already done. Not only that, I had to write the uh, faculty guide so specifically that somebody else would implement it for the first time. I never implemented this. It was implemented by three other faculty members and all of us sat down and um, wrote it and collaborated on it and it also got published. Dr. Juan, back to you. You know, first of all, before I go to my story, I just say, you know, Dr. Silva, you make it sound so easy. You know, pediatrician and teacher, director of this, director of that, uh, dean, um, wave the magic wand and you publish. And what I do know though, is underneath that it's an iceberg. You did so much work. You looked for the opportunities, you went for them. And so it's, it's um, I agree, not something that everyone can do, but I think the amount of hard work and we, you know, we're all learning failures at the same time that go under that. Um, and so that that's one thing I just wanted to highlight about this amazing story is what goes underneath and the part that we don't see uh, quite as much. Um, my story has that as well. You know, what you see here are the positive aspects. I started out as a hospitalist and I got a lot of training mainly because I had no idea what it meant to be an educator. And I also trained in an era where it really wasn't a viable career direction. You kind of taught in addition to being a clinician and a pursuit of a career as an educational leader or as an educational scholar it just wasn't something that would compare to being an NIH funded researcher. Um, I dabbled a lot, you know, Dr. Soto Green talked a little bit about, you know, trying to get focus in your career. I did not have focus. I kind of tried a little bit of computer stuff and then learned a lot about surveys and, and just kind of had this sort of shotgun approach to my interests. Um, I think over time, I found out that I had my love in faculty development. So I started out with student education, and then I was an associate program director, but it's really faculty, faculty like you all that really get me so excited about the work that we do. And that has kind of pivoted a bit in the past um, year, in fact, to really focus on academic affairs and career development. And you know, here I am as a dean by accident in some ways, um, because what I really loved to do was to help people advance in their careers. Uh, in the meantime, peer review was really an important theme throughout my life. I, I am, I was an English major, but I say that with a big caveat, which is you don't need to be an English major to publish at all. I just love the written word and I love reading. 
And that was really what I was interested in doing in college. So I became a peer reviewer even before I became an author. And what that opportunity helped me do was to learn what does less polished manuscripts look like before they look all fancy in a journal. That helped me understand, oh, wow, I've never heard of this statistical approach. Maybe I can read about it. So for me, it was this huge substrate of learning. And then kind of armed with all that information, it taught me, oh, this is how I could write. I could follow some of these templates for writing. My hope is actually to show you some of those templates. Dr. Silva mentioned templates. And in some ways, you can approach scholarly writing in a very formulaic way in, a hope, in the hopes that that might lower you know, writing barriers for you. And then after being a peer reviewer, I learned to write, do some more research, and then leaned into opportunities to be an associate editor, to be on editorial boards, and then finally, um, just my dream job, which is editorial uh, editor in chief at Meta Portal, clearly a title I can't even say myself. So just a couple of things about how you think about your teaching. You heard just a great example about how a teaching opportunity and an interest, so those two things are combined, uh, an interest and a teaching activity, eventually led to scholarship. So, you know, I'm asking you to think about all the ways that you teach on a regular basis. Maybe you think about it as kind of, oh yeah, I have to give that annual lecture to my fellows again, or this is the time of year when I give this workshop. What I want you to do is think about how might I translate these into scholarship, making it count twice and three times and so forth. Here are just some examples. Anyone who gives a clinical lecture essentially has the scaffold for a review, right? You start out with the epidemiology of a disease, diagnosis, treatment, you know, prognosis. There you have an outline. So perhaps that's something that you could write a review about, either as a book chapter or as a clinical review. Then another thing that's a little bit separate from scholarship, but more about dissemination, which is a major theme here, is if I do a workshop here, maybe I can take it to the next level. JP Sanchez allowed um, Debbie to take her workshop and you know, basically bring it to other medical schools who are really hungry for that type of content. So that's a way in which you can think about growing from the local environment onto the national stage then maybe there's a way that you can distribute that information even more broadly. Maybe there will be a professional society or other organization who is interested in taking that content, the work that you put together and distribute it online. And then lastly, this is probably more in the category of educational innovations and how we evaluate that, but you can do research based on your teaching. So, um, you know, low scale pilot project could then become a more systematic evaluation of that work than be published somewhere in a medical education journal. So um, again, I'll take a moment to say, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we're happy to address them. I'll spend like three or four slides on MedEd Portal, but I do wanna think about principles that are generalizable to other scholarship environments because as much as I would love that, MedEd Portal is not gonna be the only place that you look in order to publish your work. So a couple of basics, it is produced by the AAMC and it's Medline indexed. So, you know, Dr. Silva's publications, you can go to PubMed, search for her name and then download her paper and all the materials that were required in order to run it. So if you wanted tomorrow to replicate her activity, you absolutely could. That's the feature that is unique about MedEd Portal is that the, the, the essence of the work isn't just in the manuscript, but it's also in the appendices as well. We peer review not just what is in the educational summary report, which is the manuscript, but also the faculty guide that she talked about, the case discussion guide. We add, we add value by making sure that those areas are high quality. And then another important thing increasingly common in an open access world is the authors keep that copyright. Instead of signing over their rights to Elsevier or Lippincott, you get to keep that work, continue to evolve on it. Um, Dr. Sanchez, excellent question. And I would say you are doing so much of that work as well. So I might, you know, uh, punt that question back to you. 
a couple of things that we're doing in Meded Portal that we're really excited about. One is we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. That has been something that has been a major focus for our journal. We have a collection on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have an anti-racism in medicine collection. We have, you know, there are opportunities to be an assistant editor or a guest editor for these collections and to be that representative in the community looking for very rich, high quality materials that can be published in MedEd Portal. And then we take a very inclusive approach. Uh, some people, some journals have basically looked around and tapped people to be editorial board members. We actually have an open application process. We recently opened up an application process for associate editors, and we sent those to people who are reviewers of MedEd Portal. And that way, there's just more open opportunities rather than being chosen. And to be honest, that's basically how I got my editorial work, which is I was essentially chosen. Um, I didn't apply or anything like that. And we feel that it's really important to make sure there's an invitation to everybody who is qualified. A couple of caveats. Uh, you know, I mentioned that because AAMC is hosting this and it's open access, you do have to make sure that it is still scholarly in approach. Some of the principles we'll talk about in the next couple of slides really get at how do you write in a scholarly manner? ICMJE stands for that International Council that defines standards for publishing in biomedicine. So making sure that you're aligning with publication ethics. Uh, as I mentioned that it's peer reviewing the materials as well. So Dr. Silva couldn't have just come up with a great idea and then kept it to herself. She had to actually implement it and more importantly, had to evaluate it, had to not just say, well, it was great and you should take my work. Another piece is that some teaching activities that you're doing aren't really something that can be published and replicated in MedEd Portal, right? So if you lead an orientation to your hospital for the medicine clerkship, well, we can't really bottle that up and publish it in MedEd Portal. It's really specific to your local institution. You're probably bringing expertise that you have that can't be expressed in other ways. So not everything that you do in your teaching can really be published. And then I mentioned that while you keep the copyright as an author in MedEd Portal, that means you actually have to own it. So if you do a lot of Google searching for images like I do, you can't publish that work because somebody else owns that copyright. So um, maybe it will be helpful to think about what's low hanging fruit as you run through the he your head about por your portfolio of teaching and what might be submittable to MedEd Portal. I think our, our real sweet, sweet spot is workshops. Workshops tend to be like 60 minutes, 90 minutes, you know, two hours in length. They involve a lot of skill building and active learning and they are anchored by those learning objectives. So that's what we get a lot of is faculty development workshops. Simulation cases or standardized patient cases. Again, very scriptable. We have a template for you to essentially enter all the details required to run a simulation case or a standardized patient case. And that's the kind of thing that gets used in MedEd Portal all the time. When we audit our search, when we audit what people are looking for when they come to MedEd Portal, by and large, they're looking for simulation type materials. So here's a great example if you are involved in simulation to get your work out there all over the world. And then lastly, interactive modules. Again, something that's online, interactive with quizzing in it. Those are the kind of things that one could plop into somebody else's curriculum without you know, re-engineering the entire thing. So very, very well suited for MedEd Portal. But on the other hand, not lectures. I mean, you think about it, everybody in the country at every medical school has their traditional lecture on anemia or on congestive heart failure. Because of that, that's not something we're gonna prioritize publishing, mainly because it's not a problem to be solved. In addition, because we really embrace active learning, lectures tend to be just a bunch of slides. We're really not in the business of just being a place where you put slide sets. And then the other piece to think about, which is key as you enter the activity of scholarship, what you do has to be additive to the literature. That means that there aren't other resources like this 
or that it advances our understanding of the science of teaching and learning. That generally isn't true about, you know, bread and butter topics on anemia and so forth. Other things. People love to come to MedEd Portal and say, I have an 18 month course and I wanna publish in MedEd Portal. That just isn't practical for many, many, many reasons. One is if you think about how many materials go with running an 18 month course, then it, it would be impossible either for us to host, for anybody to peer review. And really most importantly, nobody is gonna plop that into their curriculum. Who's gonna be able to have room for an 18 month curriculum? So there are practical realities about what can be submitted to MedEd Portal. That does also include, you know, multi-hour sessions. This is where you might want to think about, could I take this set of 12 simulation cases and maybe publish three at a time that cohere in some thematic way? Assessment tools we absolutely do publish in MedEd Portal it's not for the faint of heart. And the reason for that is because it can't be, oh, I came up with the survey, I really like it a lot and I'd like to submit it to MedEd Portal. It does require validity evidence, which requires comparing it to other variables, doing content validity and a lot of other things that are just hard work. So I'd say it's not easy for this to be your first foray into MedEd Portal. And then my last slide on MedEd Portal before I start talking about principles that you can apply to scholarly writing in general is what gets rejected from MedEd Portal. So one thing is we are a journal, just like any other publication venue. So we're not really in the business of disseminating work that's already out there. If you have a viral TikTok video, like all kudos to you, but MedEd Portal is really not the place since it's already out there. Sample size, always a key Thing that's a problem in educational research because we only have a certain number of learners available to us. I would say we don't have a hard threshold, but if you are talking about single digits, that will be really hard for anybody to draw meaningful, meaningful conclusions from the evaluation of single digit learners. This is a nuance is around describing process rather than a generalizable activity. One key example is like, let's say you collected three of the best teachers in your institution, put them on a panel and had them talk about career development. Awesome teaching activity, the kind I've done before, for sure. But how much of that can be packageable? How much of that is about, you know, faculty member A's story and faculty member B's resources and expertise? That's not really something you could put into a submission that really represents that original activity. So those are really more about the process and less about the packageable elements. The last piece is also nuanced. And you'll note all of these things, uh, um, one put it in the chat, we have an author center that kind of walks through some of the pitfalls that people can run into when they're trying to submit to MedEd Portal. One of those things is if you're, the essence of your work is essentially go to this website, read this book and download this paper and we'll stitch it all together. That really is not necessarily unique or innovative. So that will struggle in the process of submitting it. So lots of considerations for sure. Um, Dr. Silva mentioned that she is a faculty mentor. Those, those were the individuals who are happy to help you think through the teaching activity you're doing, potentially submitting it to MedEd Portal. So a little bit about preparation. I mentioned that educational summary report, which is essentially the manuscript. It's the thing that follows classics, classics criteria for scholarship. And I, you know, I put a lot of emphasis, to, emphasis into this because this is the place where you showcase what you do. That being said, it does have to be presented in a way that's organized and aligned with scholarly principles. And that first principle, is that your objectives are specific and that they're measurable, you know, those SMART objectives. Um, objectives that are not particularly measurable are recognize or understand or feel or acknowledge. You wanna make sure you do exactly what Dr. Silva did, which was she aligned her evaluation with her objectives. If her objective was to teach this skill, then her evaluation said this, you know, found out a way to measure the skill in that learner. So something to think about, 
not just when you submit to MedEd Portal, but in your work in general, is how do I make sure that I create an activity that aligns with what I want to do? I'm gonna briefly take a quick run through each of the sections of a traditional manuscript, intro, methods, results, discussion, just to give you a guide for how you would approach uh, a manuscript. This is the part that I hope is very generalizable, not just about MedEd Portal, but for any kind of manuscript that you're putting together. The first thing about the intro is this is where you make an argument for why your work adds to the literature. So I borrow from Lorelei Lingard's framework, problem, gap, hook, and I've modified it to be problem, gap, purpose, which is a little bit easier for me to remember. So the problem is essentially a statement of the problem that you're trying to solve. For most people, it might be a clinical problem. A lot of the submissions to Meted Portal are educational problems or training gaps. Now, the second one is the gap. And I don't mean it's just a reiteration of the problem. The problem is that um, you know, our workforce is not diverse, but that's not the gap. The gap is the gap in the literature. And it's important to say, therefore, but what we look in, when we look in the literature, there are not you know, specific initiatives that focus on this part of the problem. What I see people fall into a lot is they say, we have a problem, for sure we have a problem. But that gap has been filled by so much of the literature. There are systematic reviews, there are dozens and dozens of papers. And so it's really unclear what that manuscript might actually add to the literature. And then lastly, simply put, it's just a statement in a very clear way about the purpose of the work. So I'll give an example that I, you know, when I was an associate program director, we were struggling trying to recruit, um, uh, recruit applicants who are from historically unrepresented backgrounds. But we were curious, well, we know what we do and we're trying to do, but I wonder what everybody else is doing. So what we did was, we did a national survey and we asked internal medicine residency directors around the country about the, what they were doing to recruit those uh, applicants who are underrepresented. The problem statement in our manuscript was, the problem is our residency workforce is not diverse and it doesn't give the pipeline that we need to have faculty that are more diverse. The gap in the literature is a lot of people have talked about their single site intervention whether it was holistic review or second site visits or these kind of things, but nobody has stitched that all together. And so therefore, and then we go to the purpose, the purpose of our work was to conduct a national survey to essentially collate strategies used around the world, uh, used around the country to recruit underrepresented faculty uh, residents. So that would be one way to kind of play out the intro. The method's a little bit more straightforward, especially when you think about it as a re recipe for what you're doing. The key questions for any study at all is what you did, who, who did you, you know, involve, where did it happen and how. For MedEd Portal in particular, there's a lot of focus on the how. So again, this is why those faculty guides are helpful. The step-by-step, -step, well, we grouped people into groups, small groups of five. We had them talk for 15 minutes, those kind of details are really critical to the method section of an educational innovation, especially in MedEd Portal. Uh, I won't talk about the results so much because they are generally focused on your evaluation. It's also hard to be kind of templated about it because it's so specific to your project. But in general, they should really follow the way your results, your methods are. So if you talk about, we trained up facilitators in order to deliver this content, then your results section should say, we recruited six faculty to be facilitators. That's the way in which they should be really parallel to each other. Uh, I'm coming up on my last couple of slides. The discussion section is for everybody, definitely me, the hardest part of the manuscript. And I have a five paragraph formula for approaching the discussion. The first is it should be kind of like your you know, public relations statement, something that is a summary of what was accomplished in your work. I generally stay away from numbers or description of why I found what I did. I keep it pretty simple. In our national survey, we found these themes. Paragraph number two, 
and there might be multiple paragraph number twos, is where you re repeat your results, but more importantly, describe why you found what you did. So don't just say X percent of our faculty, you know, experienced this. Talk about why you found what you did. That's really what the discussion is for, is for you to kind of speculate on the underlying reasons for your results. The third thing is about putting it in context. What did you learn from having implemented your work? So I'm sure Dr. Silva, in the six times that she gave one of her, uh, one of her workshops, learned something and has the opportunity to share those lessons learned with other people. Paragraph four is universal. Every single discussion section needs to talk about the limitations of the work that you did. It needs to be a reflective critique of your own work. That being said, I'm surprised at how many people still leave limitations out of their papers. And then lastly, paragraph five is your next steps. What would you do as a result of what you've learned? What would you re recommend for other people? What other learner groups would you like to implement your work on? So that's kind of a rundown of all the manuscript elements for MedEd Portal, but also applicable to other things. So I think I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Silva. Thank you, Dr. Huang. So for the last two slides, I would like to start uh, reflecting a little bit of um, collaborative writing. And the reason is that because Meta Portal, when you have the experience, it gives you a template to follow. Um, I definitely think that it helped me a lot to work collaboratively with others that have been through the experience, the prior experience of working with Meta Portal. Like Dr. Juan just said, they're mentors that met their men at Portal faculty mentors. And in my case, I had JP. And because um, it is research and it has to be rigorous, but at the same time, you are doing what you do every day, which is develop an educational module. You might not go through the process as it should be. So it is really important to, to look for those mentors. And collaboration has been key in the, in the success of our two publications. I think that learning to work with others linearly or otherwise have been an amazing experience for me. Um, and that prior experience that JP had and others had in our group definitely helped us. He would put us back on track and pinpoint again, remember objectives and evaluation, remember. And once you get the need of what is what you need to do, then it was me that would say the remember, um, you need to make sure that you're teaching what you're evaluating because if not, it's not going to work. Those are the things that collaboration uh, will help you with. And divide and conquer. Collaboration is about dividing the work and conquering and making sure that it is very purposely done. So use some platforms, I would say, we use Dropbox, Teams, Google Forms. Um, we've used everything. And it helps keep everyone organized and in the same page. And it also helps to take everyone to the finish line, just like project management. Next slide. And I will end with some lessons learned. The first is that I do think that we need to start with what we're passionate about. It makes a difference. So we look for a topic that you're passionate about. And if you're not sure, ask a mentor. I'm a mentor. I'm also a mentee. For sure, I know what my mentees are passionate about. And definitely, my mentors do too. So that helped. Dr. Sanchez knew I was passionate about um, the care of Puerto Ricans. And he said, you know, let's go that way. Start with a big, important, and critical pro problem. Start there. You might want to make it smaller as you go in, but start big. Think big because that's going to make a difference. You are publishing so that others can use what, what um, you're producing so that you can actually make an impact, make a difference. Um, and then for me, it's very important that you take care of the work from the beginning to end. You might start with a gap. Somebody gives you part of it and you start collaboration but there is a very big difference. So when you start from beginning to end with those objectives and you think through your project and you think of the impact you want to make, it is cleaner. It is streamlined. 
you can see a better product. No, you can. Be willing to learn new skills and be willing to fail. So the first time that I wrote my module, it was definitely not perfect. Um, I sent it to JP, JP sent it back and he said, you know, it's 45 minutes. And I said, but I want to teach like six hours. I mean, this is like six hours. So you have to fail and then try again and learn those skills and match. Match that mission and goals with what you're teaching and what you're passionate about with your scholarship so that you can make it count twice and you will have a lot more possibility of being successful. Thank you.